Hey, what a privilege and honor we have today. Uh, we know how wonderful this is going to be because we were here in the first service and heard it. But we have our pastor who we love dearly and honor and respect so much. God has used him and is using him now all over the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's here to share a specific word for In His Presence Church today. And just a quick um, inter introductory is... Years ago, uh, my father became a born-again Christian, and I thought my dad had gone nuts. And he was attending, at that time, a small church of about 300 people called Church on the Way, which grew into a super mega church, one of the greatest churches of our times, with one of the greatest leaders, generals of our, of our lifetime, is here with us. But during that time, as my dad would witness to me, he got together with a friend at Church on the Way, and they wrote a little prayer, praying for the perfect laborer to come across our path, which God sent uh, my husband into my life. Come on, somebody. And, and then as the years went on, and we knew we were called, you know, we were not preacher's kids. We didn't grow up in the ministry. We use that line from Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're making this up as we go along. So it's been a lot of our journey in ministry, but as we were beginning to start a church, my parents were going to go ahead and pay for our, the attorneys and get us set up right. And then my husband said, no, let's, let's take out a second on our house, our little house in Van Nuys. And he said, I want to make sure that we get Pastor Jack Hayford's attorney because he's the most integrous man I know in the ministry. And through his attorneys, recommended our CPAs. And then as life challenges went on and we found ourselves in a, in a great challenge years ago, Pastor Mel called Pastor Jack and said, is there any way we can meet with you? And he said, we're thinking maybe six months down the line we'll get a meeting. And he said, what are you guys doing for lunch today? And we got to have lunch with him. And throughout our journey in ministry, there's only been a couple times where we have so needed a spiritual father to speak into our life and to direct us and give us wisdom. And I thank God for pastor jack being that spiritual father and mentor into our lives and in his presence church i want you to stand up and give a warm in his presence church welcome <laughs> pastor jack pastor hayford jack hayford <clears throat> come Thank on you. sir so good to have you here with us thank you thank, thank you. you thank you mel okay desiree thank you thank you both and thank you everybody thank you it's nice to be here Please be seated. Thank you. That's very gracious, and it's nice to be there. It's a, you know, people will sometimes say things about you, and you think, you know, uh, I, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> it sounds better than I would have imagined. It's a, a thrill to be here. It truly is. It's been a little bit of time since I've been back because of what's gone on in the last three years, better, nearly three years. Uh, in fact, it was three years ago right now, I discovered in the end of my fingers a uh, kind of a tingling had begun. And uh, I'll mention this because it relates to that. This, uh, if you saw me coming up with a cane, it's not uh, for effect. It's uh, just for practical good sense. And I wish I'd have had it when I fell and broke my hand the other day. Uh, let's hear a little sympathy in the room. And just, oh, poor, ba poor baby, poor baby, poor baby. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking about this morning when I <laughs> got up. I was thinking about walking up on the platform and I knew I'd have the cane. And now this is, of course, uh, this happened three weeks ago, and I'll, I'll be fine in another five, four, four or five weeks. I'll have this off. But uh, the, uh, I was thinking, <laughs> you come up, here comes this aging guy up here, and uh, who has just entered his 80s, if you will. And, uh, you know, I don't say that for effect, but people do applaud when you say it, and it's because they look at you and think, is that all? You know, and uh, they're amazed that you yet breathe. And uh, when I uh, was thinking about coming <laughs> up t 
today with his cast on beside the fact that by reason of the surgery I started to mention that came as a result of the discovering of the tingling and I'm not going to tell you any more about it but it was uh, quite an ordeal and it uh, stretched out over about a year and a half period of time of recovery and uh, upper neck thing it's, it's, it's you really can't tell it part either don't tell it at all or don't tell or tell some details so it makes sense so I'm sparing you but at any rate the Lord really did probably there's every reason to think he spared my life by the diagnosis that recognized what was going on that was causing this tingling anyway uh, I am here and alive and moving and in your 80s and a uh, broken hand and on a cane, and I thought there's going to be people look up there and say, I know what the strategy is having this guy today. This is not just because they love this man, because I'm grateful to say uh, that they do love Anna and me, and we love them and honor their ministry. But I, uh, I thought they'll say, this is because it's a Sunday before New Year's, and they invited Father Time to be here today. So... So here we are in keeping with the seasonal theme. (laughs) Well, it is a happy thing to be uh, in his presence again. While I'm up here uh, with the various mumblings before I actually begin and get down to brass tacks, would you open your Bible to John chapter 13? And uh, the accumulation of years are a delightful thing to have happen, not just because you have life, but because you are walking it in the Lord and because there's just so many wonderful things the Lord continues to allow Anna and me to experience. She is not here this morning and uh, I, in the first service I laughed when I said it, not because of the fact that she needed knee replacement surgery, but because it's just another thing about the aging couple that have not only uh, entered their 80s, both of us, we just entered our 80s, just entered them. And we will, this coming year, celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. And uh, so 58 of those years we have been in public ministry and pastored many, many years and uh, served other offices in the body of Christ and uh, presently are uh, still have gracious welcomes a lot of places. And as a matter of fact, I need to choose to do less so I can write more. Uh, of things that are incumbent upon me by many invitations that I'm grateful for. And, uh, but Anna's not here today because there's just the residue a bit of the discomfort from the knee replacement surgery. And she did not ask to not come this morning. We live here in the valley, which I think probably most of you know or would have figured out. But uh, I said to her, you know, there's times a wise husband will recognize there are times that your wife doesn't need to be someplace that she's going to be and you're involved and if you just say honey you really don't have to do this would that be okay you stay home and uh, she said thank you thank you so she's not here but uh, she enjoys being here as much as I do and uh With that, I think I've made my welcome. I did want to tell you about, uh, having rambled on about my age, about uh, two or three of my most recent birthday cards. Are you ready for this? Okay, well, if you don't want it, we'll forget it. No, hey, listen, don't give me that. I mean, you had your crack at it, and you, you know, this dull, dull fills the room. What is this guy? Tough, tough. You missed it. Okay, let's read. First card, okay, make a birthday card with your hands. Okay, so now when I go like this, then turn so you can get the punchline on the inside, okay? We're not at prayer right now. This is a birthday card like this, okay? There's people out there. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Okay, the birthday card. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how this works. This is not convenient. For birthday cards. Uh, Front of the card says, Happy birthday. You the man. You the man, yeah. You the man. You the old man, but you the man. (laughs) 
Got a card that says uh, on the front, this, I'll end with this one because if you can stomach this, you, we've gone as far as we can go. In front of the card it says, happy birthday. Say, I got this five years ago, by the way. It says, happy birthday. For your 75th, I want to ask you a question. Do old men wear boxer shorts or briefs? Depends. It just... <laughs> Uh, there was a matching card to that that has Garfield on the front of it, and he says, he says, happy birthday. He says, uh, I'm not saying you're old, but if you were a car, I wouldn't let you park in my driveway without putting a pan under you. <laughs> Do you detect a theme? I envisioned myself this morning being here with you, and that's the reason I'm glad this chair is here, because I felt that my, even my physical stance, I will get up at some, at some point in the message because of uh, what motivates my sense of need to stand at that point. But I want to read from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, and I want to read select portions of the text. And I want to sit down and talk to you, and I want to come today for, in fact, what I've been referred to as, and I am in a good bit of the body of Christ. It's a humbling thing when people speak of you not only of being a spiritual father to them, but being a father in some regards to several parts of the church and to many leaders. And those are things that if you have a brain uh, and any spiritual sensitivity, you know that those are great graces of God to you. They're not attainments or achievements. And they certainly don't give you any unusual authority. But they do signal a time of your life, an age, a time that you are. And uh, that is a part of my sitting down because to do three services, I don't have the stamina that I did in past years when I would do four and five services oftentimes on a Sunday. And... uh, so as I uh, will sit down a little bit, I want to talk to you in a, uh, if you'll forgive me, in kind of a paternal way. For some people, a paternal reference isn't necessarily a happy thing because of some strain that may have happened with a parent. But uh, I don't know that that's the case between me and anyone in this room. And I want to talk to you in very much the way that I think John may have. The Gospel of John is the, uh, actually uh, the last of the five books that John wrote in the scriptures chronologically. He would have been a little bit older than I am right now when he wrote, when he wrote this gospel. That's a historical fact. He was pastoring a church, was in his uh, senior season of his life, and there would have been others. There was uh, deacons who worked with him and Uh, You have to read church history to get some of this stuff. But he pastored a church in southeastern part, uh, the southwestern part of present-day Turkey. That's where it was, uh, the church of Ephesus. He was the pastor there for several years. And uh, Ephesians, the letter, was uh, written when Paul uh, later on, uh, or earlier, in fact, of course, had founded that church talks about it in the 17th, 18th chapters, 18th, 19th, I think it is, of the book of Acts. And in chapter 13, John is writing to the larger body of Christ of that time. And he's relating something that took place on a day that was before the most significant day in human history that uh, we have just celebrated Christmas But uh, that day occurred for the sake of another day. He was born to die. And this chapter 13 takes place the night before. And John is uh, relating years later of how it was that uh, Jesus had given a commandment. It's sometimes called the 11th commandment or the great commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. The context in which he gave it is very significant. I don't want to take time to read the entire chapter because to, uh, you, you have to read all but at least two chapters to get things I'm going to reference. But I want to read 
key verses and then skip someplace, but I will reference things in between this way because I found that extended reading of a, of a passage, people grow a little numb to it, but if I stop and talk and we... But I would like to suggest that today before the day's out, as you may possibly have come back to your mind being here or covering this text, that you sit down at home and read the 13th chapter of John. What chapter is that? Jan John... What? Where is it? Well, where's John? In the Bible. That's very good. Okay. Very good. Quick, quick, Pastor. You're doing a good job. Verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had, uh, had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Would you say that phrase with me? He, say it again, please. He loved them to the end. It's referencing, of course, his, we commonly think, we, that we, we commonly think he's referencing his death the next day. That's not what he's referencing. That's the first thing I want to point out, and we'll talk about what he is referencing in a few minutes. It was the night before his crucifixion, however, supper being ended, that's the last supper we're talking about, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself, and after that poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Verse six begins an exchange that takes place when he comes to Peter, Simon Peter. And when he comes to Peter, Peter sees Jesus preparing to wash his feet, which is unthinkable to Peter. Now let me say momentarily what most of you are aware of, that the tradition in the culture was that when you were a guest at a home, uh, you arrived and there would be a servant provided to wash your feet dusty roads, wearing sandals. This wasn't a matter of something that you could ingest, think might be a reference you would make because of feet that are encased in shoes and socks all day, may have at least some aroma that you're washing away. And that wasn't the point. It was dust and dirt, the signs of where people had been that day, walking through marketplaces, marketplaces in ancient times and in some parts of the world today, be something spattered on them from things, including the possibility of just a spattering of a little drip of blood or so that might come from meat that's hung out in the open way without air conditioning placed, a place of uh, protection or a uh, typical butcher shop in our time. It was another world, another time, and washing feet was a regular part of it, but it was nearly always done by a household servant. And the fact that Jesus takes this role and begins to wash his disciples' feet as their master, their Lord, their rabbi, their Messiah, is unthinkable to Peter. And he says, you will not wash my feet. Now, please listen, because this is one of the pivot points in this message. And Jesus says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Basically, he's not saying, I hate you, I'm kicking you out. He's saying, you don't have that understanding I want you to have that is pivotal, pivotal, to what's to happen with you and with what you don't even understand is en route to being born. He had told them six months before that he would build a church, a people, that would make a difference in the world. But uh, they were yet to get that. The time is coming now. The cross is coming, and weeks later, Pentecost, and then the power of the Spirit and the spread of the church throughout the earth. But at this particular pivotal juncture, he is laying down something that I felt led to bring to you for this reason. The essence of this message points to something that is an appropriate consideration for all of us as we stand here, uh, three, sit here three days, four days, coming up on the New Year's. It's a season which many of us usually take a time for some personal reassessment. I think it's a good practice. People will joke sometimes about resolutions and how seldom that they are kept as they should be. So I don't speak of it really in terms of resolutions, but I do think some sense of resolve and review. 
is beneficial to all of us as we come at the end of the year. It's a logical time to say, where am I? What's happening with me? Where am I headed? And it's not that the calendar changes a thing, but we do change the calendar. And I think we're more likely to change a lot of other things if we take time to review. And I don't know of anything that would be more fundamental of value than for you and me, each one, to review this passage of Scripture because Jesus puts such an absolute priority on it before we finish the text. Now, as Peter said that... Uh, <laughs> He was saying, basically, I'm not worthy you wash my feet. This is ridiculous. Jesus says, what's ridiculous, sir, is if you don't understand what I'm doing, I'll explain it to you in a few moments, but you do not have a part in it if you don't let me wash your feet. When he gets done washing all their feet, now remember, there were 12 of them, the apostles. He washed the disciples. He washed all their feet. I want to make special note that Judas was among those. Judas, who already knows he has arranged a betrayal of Jesus. Jesus knows this. He already knew. He knew that Judas had betrayed him. Nobody else knows that. Jesus knows it. Listen, and he washes his feet too. He washes his feet too. And when he does, he comes to the place that they were serving the bread and uh, cup of the Last Supper, which he was introducing. It was the first supper of what we celebrate as frequently as you may here at the church of the Lord's Table. And that was the introduction of it on this occasion. It's the night before Jesus' crucifixion. It's three days from Easter. It's the, the sun has set. That Shabbat had become begun. They are partaking together, and as they do, they break the bread, the cup, and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is the cup, New Testament, my blood, which is shed for many for remission of sins. He is announcing his death, his cross, and as he does that, something is going in the heart of another person who is there, and I'll come to that as we get further in. There's already been a stark confrontation with one of the 12, Peter. Another one is being faced right now, and that one is Judas. As he comes to Judas and gives him the bread, the Bible says, now look at this text with me, please, because it is profound that verse 27, after the piece of bread, verse 27, Satan entered him. Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Come down three verses, verse 30. And Judas, having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately. And so poignantly, John writes, and it was night. They'd arrived in the late afternoon. The Shabbat had begun, but now it was dark. But how timely a mention of Judas went out now, bent on his own intention, which I want to qualify his motive as surely as understanding Peter's. The conclusion of the text comes down in verse uh, 23. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Whatever translation you have in hand, would you read verse 34 and 35 aloud with me? Let's read a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Stepping into a new year, I can't think of any more appropriate point of personal reassessment assessment as a follower of Jesus than this. Because he said, not only is this a directive, 
of how I relate to you and to the people around me, but it will become a sign to the world itself that there is a love in this group that is not known in generally in the world because it has the spirit of Jesus in it. When he says, love one another as I have loved you, however, there's two words here in this text, the last one we just read and the first one we read that are very commonly misunderstood. And so I want to begin there, although I've begun pretty well and into this, so don't get nervous. I mean, he's starting now and he's been up there for two hours. (laughs) That you love one another as I have loved you. If you were to poll a hundred people in this room right now, have them put it on a piece of paper so they can make a commitment and nobody would know who it was. When Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, and it says, how did Jesus mean for us to love one another? Well, we know that when Jesus said, as I have loved you, and I would estimate safely 95 out of 100 would say he died for us. I think that's what most, I wouldn't be surprised it would be 98%. And that is all 98% are wrong and the other 2%, whatever they put, I don't know. Because he says it and in the text, it is in the past tense and that's very significant. He's gonna die tomorrow. So he's not talking about something he can say the way I go to the cross for you. Number one, because we don't need somebody else to die for us. And if anyone in some act of sacrifice died for another person, which often takes place, indeed, people in military are dying for people and, uh, and for the interests of a nation. And there are instances where people do rise to a moment's defense, but that is not a qualification to be a disciple of Jesus. Everybody with me? He said, as I have loved you. He was talking about what had just happened. He said, I'll explain this afterwards. Everybody with me? As I have loved you, that the servant heart, never too good, never too good to stoop to help other people, never so self-important you think I'm above that because a servant in a household is not above that. There is something that all of us are heir to, human fear and human pride. Both those things. The fear of somehow having been perhaps exploited or mistreated ourselves, that if we somehow, as believers, uh, give ourselves at all to something of, that would be less than my station in life, having perhaps suffered earlier in your life embarrassment and mistreatment because of the station in life you led, or the gender you are, or the ethnic group you're a part of, whatever it may be, the trade that you were involved in, People mistreat people. And so I don't want to do something that would somehow sacrifice some, well, in fact, what it is is status. Some status I've arrived at. Not that we flaunt it. Not that we go around thinking, I am somebody. Because I think that the average believer is going to be beyond that. But we can somehow feel, well, I I, I don't know if I should do that. Examples occur in my mind of things just in this past year where I've had to make a choice about how I relate to that. Not because I feel important, but because you don't want to be misunderstood. And, and I suppose I'd have to face the choice too about do you think that uh, that inconvenience is worthy of you? Because when you have a pretty busy life, there's sometimes you think, well, I'll have somebody else do that. And it's not that that's wrong every time at all. In fact, we many times, depending upon the responsibilities you have, you'll need to have other people do things that you can't do. But there's times I'll ask myself, am I having somebody else do it because I need somebody else to do it or because I don't want to do it because I don't want to face that? The heart of a servant is not a demeaning of your identity. It is not a a, a dismissing of anything of your worth. In fact, it's taking on a sense of the worthiness of being endowed by Jesus as being a servant of his in his place at that place at that time. Are you hearing me? 
Somebody wave at me if you're, we're, we're connecting. Okay. <clears throat> now, in this, he loved them to the end, which ends the first verse. That's the end. He loved them to the end. Having knew that his time had come, he loved them to the end. And the most common way to read that is also distorted in the same way that we will, by nature, looking at the setting, think that in saying, love one another as I have loved you, we jump ahead to the Calvary, to Calvary and he's dying for us when in fact he had just washed their feet, which is what he was referencing. He loved them to the end. We think, well, this was the last night before the crucifixion that having walked with the disciples, he loved them and introduced communion and it was a marvelous evening of his tenderness and nearness to us and the fellowship we had, so forth. <clears throat> but right up to the end, just before he was crucified, and that's not the word that's used. In the original text, there's another word it would use is if it was the finish. We use the word end. The motion picture comes to an end, the end. Say, well, this is the end, we'll leave, and like that. It's not that kind of the end. It's uh, the word derived from the Greek word telos, which is the word teleology comes from stuff. It's the study of objectives or intentions. Telos is a word that you see. In fact, there's, I think, a company named with a cognate word of that. And it has to do with objectives. We say the end justifies the mean and it means. And we're not saying the final everything justifies the means. We're saying the objective in view justifies the means. So Jesus, having spent three and a half years discipling them and coming to his last chance with them, he wants to nail down what all of this training and shaping and preparation was about. He is saying in these two, that John is saying in these two verses, first, the objective of Christ coming to work in the lives of people is to cultivate a caring people who are not so self-important or taken with themselves that they don't have time or patience with other people. A servant, as a person who's an employee, for example, doesn't have always a chance to talk back. They have to make a choice as to whether the job is my job, and it's not just for a matter of having a job, but it's for a matter of doing the job. He said, I want you to understand the objective of what we're about as ones who I am going to build into a church. And then when he gets done, he says, now, I'm making this a commandment. This is taking on a status that your choice does not enter, enter into it any more than the choice of the Ten Commandments. Oh, it can be broken. It can be disobeyed. But forgiveness for the Ten Commandments is something that's a part of our salvation. And then we're called to live within the parameters of that, not to be saved, but to live like people who are saved. Right? Hello? Are you there? That was pretty quiet. But live like people who are saved. Still a little wimpy. But to live like people who are saved. The commandments stand firm. Forgiveness for, their, for failing them is not a license to indulge upon. But the point is, he adds this commandment. That you love one another like I loved you. Because I'm not calling you to have a foot washing service every time you turn around. I'm calling you to go to the embarrassment, not to take a position of status that disallows your availability to care for a broken world. Because he might have said to them, as my own, as ones who in fact will establish models, leadership for others, you will come to times that you are mistreated, misunderstood, and I'm not giving you license to retaliate in kind. I'm calling you to continue to be what I've called you to be. I'm calling you to be people that are of another spirit than the spirit of this world, that the spirit of God 
dwelling in them who is the spirit of love, is the one who primarily dominates your value system toward everyone around you, whatever you like or don't like. He doesn't say it here, but in the 18th chapter of Matthew, he essentially does. So I could add these words, that it will mandate your being forgiving of people that really frustrate, irritate, or wound you, or wounded you in your past. He's calling for the new breed, the truly born again, not as a slogan title, but the truly transformed who are growing in that transformation. The brink of 90, of the, on the brink of 2014, I, I, I need to hold this up in front of me and say, Jack, where are you? Since I received the Lord, and that's 70 years ago, it's been a growth process that doesn't end. It's been decision making. You know, when you're my age and have the privileges of recognition that people so kindly give Anna and me. With God-blessed, remarkable favor in so many ways, and some of you have never heard of me before, and uh, there are billions of people who have never heard of me, so don't be surprised if you haven't. But uh, <laughs> there are many have, and you're treated very kindly. The raft of Christmas cards Anna and I received just blows us away. The notes they write with them. But that provides me with no license except a license that says, redeemed son of God, disciple of Jesus, servant to a world in need. That's the license we have. Amen. Now I want to note these things. He loved them unto this objective. I am very, very moved with a showdown moment that occurred in the lives of two people in this text. It, it's, it's very profound. I, I had studied that I, I, at college level, people entering ministry, I taught the Gospel of John for many years. And uh, as I, uh, so I, I've, I've been here a lot of times. But it's only been in about the last uh, two, three years that, one t uh, that I noticed how dramatically in juxtaposition are, are these two, Peter's response and Ju Judas's response, and what was motivati motivating both of them in this moment. And then when I conjoin that to the fact that Jesus categorically makes this a call with a level of a commandment. This is command authority. The master of the house is speaking, not me. We're talking about Jesus, the house. We're talking about the Lord of the manor. And as he speaks, he says, I want you to understand that I am commanding you to relate to one another as believers in that way. But he says, if you do that, the world will notice how you relate to one another. Even when you have tough contact and problems and things you feel that justify your criticism and allow you to uh, be uncaring or whatever it may be, we all experience this all the time. There's not going to be a week go by that in some way you have to come to terms with where you live in terms of this commandment. This isn't something that's episodic. It's not something that takes place by reason of given events. It's something that costs us something all the time. In terms, of, let me take one place that many people would not even think of it having to do with. It takes place every time you disagree with something you feel about a governmental leader who by biblical command you are called to pray for those that have the authority over you. And the fact is that if you are ticked off at some governmental leader or anybody else for that matter, you cannot pray with a heart of love for their well-being. It'll be with a heart of judgmentalism for something to be visited upon them, not necessarily their death, but say, God, change all this. There's, the, the Bible says the pathway for there to be peace in a society is to pray for the governmental leadership. It didn't say 
what their office was. At the time that was written in the scripture, you can find it in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, and it's given as one of the priorities. Paul says to Timothy, who was at that time taking the church John is now the pastor of years later, and he says, I exhort first of all, prayer, supplication, giving of thanks be made for all men and all who are in authority that you may lead a quiet and peaceable life. If there's things fouled up in culture, don't blame the government. Blame a prayerless body of believers in the nation. And that's true. That's true. And you don't get good government by getting everybody to be a Christian. You can't, you, you're not, not going to produce that. If everybody became a Christian, the, the only time we ever had the Christians take over, it all turned sour. The Lord said, my kingdom isn't of this world. You're interposing a different spirit, not a different slate of officers. I like to point out to people that God is neither Democrat nor Republican, for example. He's not even an American. <laughs> the fact is that we're called to pray for those that are in authority. He says, does that mean I can't speak out? I can't vote differently? I didn't say that. You make an advised, a well-advised vote. Party politics is what it is, but the believer has to live with a spirit of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean with regard to what I've just cited that I cannot have a political opinion or vote or even speak or run for office or fill office. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is a different spirit about it. It's driven by conviction, not by anger and bitterness. Is driven by principle and not by spit. Are you with me? Now, that's just a simple illustration, but it's a pretty practical one because there's a need for a revival of prayer in the body of Christ for our country, and it's not going to take place unless there comes a passion that exceeds political opinion. It has to be driven by the belief that this nation needs the presence and the workings of God in new and moving and powerful ways. Can I hear an amen to that one? Now let me tell you the good news about this sermon. It's just about over. I've learned to say that because it gives people hope. There is a dramatic showdown within the soul of two people in this text. The first is Peter. The second is Judas. And I want to give you the context. You've read the passage, but this has to do with their lives where it had come to this point. They'd both been walking with the Lord for at least three years, closer to three and a half. They'd been commissioned. They'd had ministry. They'd seen miracles. Yeah, all 12 of them. Judas included. Someplace along the line, Judas became entranced with money. There was a time that by reason he was entrusted with caring for the affairs, the financial affairs of the 12 when they traveled, uh, for a reason. They thought he had the smarts and they thought this is a guy you can trust, but they later discovered you couldn't trust him. They discovered that he was cutting into the, cutting into the sack for himself. And the Bible tells about that. Now, there'd probably been a dealing with it and it had been forgiven. And so, because Judas is still here with them, he didn't get kicked out of the party. But he does have clearly an agenda. And you can learn this from other things you see about Judas, especially when they come to this time right here where they are in this text we just read. Because that's when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. He makes clear he's going to the cross. He has talked to them about serving one another. He, the leader, the king Judas envisions is the Messiah who is going to shortly, in fact, probably at this Passover as the crowds gather, and there are so many now in the land that have been impacted by Jesus, and they say, here's a guy that can make water wine, and he can take bread and multiply it, and he's got power to heal anything that happens. And when he's there, the bad stuff just gets out of the scene. This, 
hey, this is the guy we want for king, but we're going to have to overthrow the Romans. The spirit of revolt was in the land. That's why there were so many Roman soldiers on hand at the time, though there was always guards. And this nation that's been suppressed thought the Messiah had come. Many people thought that Judas was in that party. He was persuaded. But listen, to tell you, no one other thing. He not only was going to be in the party, he's in the first 12. Top seats of the government. And he's the guy that manages the money. And we already know his vulnerability to money on hand. And now Jesus is saying, Jesus, this guy that, this is going to be my leader and he's squatting down here washing our feet? I don't get it. We're talking about taking charge. We're talking about God's people taking charge. Because this is the Son of God, the Messiah. And then Jesus comes to him, and something's going on stewing in Judas. And he's heard now about the cross. Washing feet was one thing, but then the Lord's table. When Jesus gave him the bread, the Bible says that with that, Satan entered his heart, and he left, and it was night. Peter's response to his misunderstanding, Lord, I'm not worthy you wash my feet. Jesus later says, I indeed am Lord. I am your master and teacher. But as I've washed your feet, so you need to wash one another's. You need to understand it's not your status. And he said, I want you to understand something about that. Let me talk to you about foot washing, what I think it basically has to do with. Her name was Joan, and she worked in my office for, I think, about four or five years that she served Anna and me and helped us. Very, very capable woman who was the primary handler of my office back in the uh, old middle 70s. And Joan uh, was a woman who had had a tragedy of a divorce in her past, a heartbreak. Her daughter was a teenager, and she had a good life, but she'd come to know the Lord, and really God's done some wonderful things in her life. And uh, she was a great help, as I said to Anna and me, in our work. I will never forget the day I was walking by Joan's desk, and I had noticed, I never thought about it, that usually later in the afternoon, uh, many days, you just see her limp a little bit. And I, I, I didn't think about it other than just something that getting tired toward the end of the day, but not why. Had no reason to ask why. That day, probably she'd been working with us for three years. And I was walking by her desk, and it was nothing indecent about the appearance of this, but she had rolled down her her hose, just a stocking, rolled down from wherever it was, above her skirt, wherever it went. It wasn't connected higher because it wasn't that kind of hose. She was rolling it down and she was reaching and rubbing one foot. And because of the, when I went by and she stooped over like that and I just walked by and glanced and I saw and I had never seen this where she was rubbing this hideous, hideous gash on the side of her foot. Just quickly put, I'll tell you when I asked and found out what caused I said, Joan, what on earth happened to you? She'd been in an accident in a car, in a rainstorm. A car had slid into her. She'd been put into a slide. The door had come open. She'd been thrown out of the car. But on the way out, it had caught on the pedals. And it was a miracle that it didn't tear her foot off. But it halfway did. And then she was out and slid over into a gutter and nearly drowned in the rapid flow of the water in the gutter. Part of her testimony was the miracle of God interposing at that point of her life, when she came to Christ, she realized what a marvel and miracle. She was, of course, amazed at the time. But this gash was at least that wide. Came all the way down by the ankle bone, down onto the foot, and it was ugly. And I said, what on earth happened to you? And she told the story. Whenever I read this text, I think of Joan. 
because it caused me to understand why she limped in the afternoon. I didn't know that she wore a raised heel in that shoe. She'd worked with me three years. I didn't know it. I didn't know anything about that. I, the condition, though, a raised heel, was enough unnaturalness to the balance of her other foot that by, during the course of a day, it would just wear a bit on her back. And that's why she would limp and just a little bit. Jesus said, I want you to wash one another's feet because there are things you don't know that have happened to people. And it's not till you get down to see where people have walked in their past, what they've experienced, what they've experienced this week, what they've experienced in heartache and heartbreak, what they've experienced in disappointment, what they've experienced by giving it everything they had and the outcome wasn't what they thought people understood, much less not being satisfactory to people who already didn't like them. And Jesus said, I'm wanting to build a group of people who think that way and live that way. People who understand that there is a broken world and you are living among redeemed ones who are themselves imperfect. And that's not something that's a fact we state as an excuse, but it's a reality we'll never escape until we get to heaven. And the Lord calls for a people that I always feel good about when I visit here because the spirit of real servanthood is modeled by your pastors. Good leaders are always in the realm of possibly being misunderstood because there's a strength of leadership. People may think that everything's coming up roses or they get to call the shots. They have no idea that it's not that way. But uh, this is a church that I've always enjoyed visiting and I'm honored to be here today because I, I, can, I can feel love in this place today. I can feel the grace of God. There's the presence of the Lord. When we were singing that, Jesus at the center of it all. I, I love that song. I love that song. And I think Jesus is saying yes. And that's exactly where I want to be. In the center with you and everywhere you are, that people will see me and what I'm like. Sometimes the world's need is so great, we feel overwhelmed. What can we do that will impact the world for the cause of Christ? Pastors Mel and Desiree Ayers and the team at In His Presence have created a global ministry outreach. Through accountability and tracking real-time ministry results, we've developed opportunities that will allow your giving to make a real difference. From planting new churches and supporting ministry leaders to preaching the gospel to the Muslim world and fighting sex trafficking, you'll know that every dollar you give to this program is changing lives for the better. Pick up the phone right now or visit us on the web and send a gift of any size today. That simple action will begin a process that will reach around the globe. In today's world of competing voices, this is a place where your financial giving is reaping an incredible harvest. The clock is ticking, so call, write, or go online today. It was just another day for an experienced Hollywood stunt woman. But during a dangerous car stunt, something went horribly wrong. That's all Desiree remembers about that day, when an incredible onset explosion left her fighting for her life. But after only 10 days, she walked out of a Los Angeles burn unit completely healed. And that remarkable miracle has now been captured in her new book, Beyond the Flame, a journey from burning devastation to healing restoration. Today, Desiree, along with her husband, Mel, pastor the growing In His Presence Church in the heart of Hollywood's entertainment industry. And this highly acclaimed book tells the story of that amazing journey. Order your copy of Beyond the Flame today and begin your own journey out of the challenges you face. What are you trusting God for? Physical healing? A financial miracle? Purpose for living? Nothing's too big for God. What He did for Desiree, He'll do for you. Beyond the Flame will encourage you to stand on the promises of God's Word, speak life into your situation, and reach for your miracle. You too can live beyond the flames in your life, and you can start today. If you've ever experienced an eating disorder or know someone who has, then you understand the shame, the humiliation, and the fear. 
Millions of men and women today are literally held in bondage to this crippling problem with no answer in sight. But now, one woman has broken through the lies of the diet industry and dared to tell the truth. Desiree Ayers was a successful Hollywood actress and professional stunt woman. She was at the top of her field and yet hid the secret of anorexia and bulimia for years. In her remarkable book, God Hunger, Desiree Ayers exposes the lies and dares to speak the truth. Order online at GodHunger.com. If you or a loved one suffers from an eating disorder, then don't wait. God Hunger. Finally, hope is here.